So today we're going to have the first focus on J wave five and Mercury two, and uh, maybe tomorrow we're going to be focusing on the speeds for testing. So what we're going to do is we're going to split the session into first half an hour we're going to talk about J wave five and Mercury two, and tomorrow half an hour we're going to talk about you know spring boot unit test cases. Can I go ahead? Make the recording is on. Screen. Hello. Fine. Okay. So you guys can uh, first tell me what is the what is the requirement for unit test basis? Why you should write unit test cases to start with? Hello. Hello. Yeah. Why should we write even the unit test cases? Sir, unit test cases uh, means we, uh, provides the facility to like test uh, each function. We can do a functional test. We can do uh, like uh, integration test as a whole. The different types of testing we can do by no. using unit. Now the question is why even write the unit test cases? There may be different type of unit test cases. Different type of tested are there, right? Why even yeah. write test? We could have easily write the Java code and get with it. Okay. You guys can tell us what is the need for unit test cases. So, uh, to check uh, if the code is working like uh, how we want it to be. Okay. So we need we basically write unit test cases because we wanted to reduce the risks of discovering issues or bug in the uh, later part of the code development, right? So if we don't write any kind of unit test cases, there may be some issues are hidden within our code, right? And the cost of you know mitigation, that particular thing when you are going into the production or in the higher environment is much more than if you write the unit test cases within your, uh, when you are doing the development. Okay, so that's a primary, you know, goal to write unit test cases to reduce the number of, you know, issues that you can have. Now there is like different uh, testing frameworks are there. Uh, what you're going to be using is the JUnit five. So in JUnit five, we're just going to look into the following features. And so first, I hope you guys know what is the, basically when you write a test cases, it reside in a separate path in my code base. And also it has a different kind of, you know, annotation driven. So each annotation has a specific meaning. And when we run the particular test, we assign different method to annotate. The purpose of running unit test cases is not to do code coverage. That's also the, the purpose of running unit test case is not only to do code coverage, but to you know cover each and every path of the execution. Okay. And when you do that, you ensure that when that particular your standalone module, your class, your methods, or your component are being covered, they are being covered all the executable path. So you don't discover that particular executable path. If you miss out, you are not going to be uh, able to discover that. And that issue may be come up later, which is going to have a much higher cost in terms of fixing that. And obviously the impact on the customer experience. So it is always advisable to write unit test case, but don't write unit test case only for just to coverage, in case the coverage of fill up another metrics. That is not the purpose of writing unit test cases. When you're writing unit test cases, always write for the scenarios that you're going to be covered. It may require that I have covered all the branching path, that is, if, else, switch, loops, etc. 
but I have not covered the particular scenarios that may be occur. So that I also need to cover. So let's see example of JUnit test cases. I hope you guys have gone through the JUnit session, so you have able to recognize all of these uh, annotations. So I'm not going to start a basic lifecycle annotations. And I want you guys to explain me the code. What are the different annotation it does? Okay, so before starting that, this is like a gradual project. What are the dependencies I have to include first? So here I have to include JMnet 5, uh, which is basically we have to include two dependencies. Uh, here we have to improve QRJ Jupyter. Qrj Jmnit Jupyter, and from here you can you know choose the Jupyter engine that is the latest version of Jmnit 5, and the same code base you can also have the older Jmnit 4 code also can be you can run simultaneously. Then you have to choose from that uh, vintage engine from the dependency, okay, and also along with that. Uh, what we have is we have also used parameterized space testing which we basically use to data driven testing that's why i have included another dependency that is junit jupyter parameter okay. so these are the two dependencies you have to include and post that you have included this uh, particular two dependencies. The other options are from the JUnit, what is JUnit, is that we can also choose the platform to also use the JUnit 5 dependency. So that's more or less the dependency we have to include, Jupyter. Or we can use also on inclusive dependency instead of you know having this dependency separately included. We can uh, not need to use every dependency simultaneously. We can simply use JUnit Jupyter, and within the Jupyter, we can use the JUnit Jupyter directly, which is like an aggregator. So here is the current version of 5.8.2, but I have chosen to use the 5.8.1. Okay, so if you just use the JUnit Jupyter, it also includes the Jupyter param as well as Jupyter API, and also it also brings in the runtime dependency of Jupyter test. So obviously, when we adding this, I have to mention the scope of this dependency. This dependency scope is basically test. So when you're going to build a package, this uh, dependencies will not go inside the package. It's only going to be using during the test okay any questions so far on the dependency no sir no okay. sir so we have we have seen this right now i wanted to tell me guys uh, this is a like a simple application i have a simple app which has few uh, sample method with which we are going to be testing all of these methods are okay they're very simple method one or two liner so here I'm going to be using different kind of annotations, okay? And all of these annotations are coming from Jupyter API, okay? So one annotation is before all, then another annotation that is coming before each, then we have test annotations. Then we have after each and after all. So if I execute this code, uh, can anybody tell me that which order they're going to be executed? And within this particular test class, I have three test methods. One, two, three. Right? We can see. You have gone through the JMnit training, right? right? Yeah. So can you just tell me what is the order of execution out here? 
we have several annotation we can see before all before each then their t test then obviously after each and after all sir from top to bottom no no not top to bottom sir, before for all mm -hmm. so for, first before all then before each then test then after each after all like okay. the order okay so that is the order so i have three test cases so how many time they going to be executed how many time this four methods will be executed test will be executed once right it has once. been connotation at the web test right yes, so how many time before all before each after each after all will be executed Okay, uh, let's execute this method. So from the ID, what you can do, right? Uh, we can, you know, execute the class, right? And from the Maven or Cadel, what you know is that we have to type Maven, and then we have to type this. Uh, we have to execute the particular task, right? Test, correct? So either way, we can execute that. Either we can write that MVN, then test, or we can write this way, okay? Okay, so if I execute this, so so my test got passed, right? Okay. Okay, so what happened out here is that um, on this annotation, uh, so before all, right? You can see also this. Uh, this is like a static method, right? So that means it's going to be executed only once. Okay. It's going to be executed only once for how many test cases you have in your class. So before everything, it will be executed only once. When the class is getting initialized, so you can initialize some static uh, resources out here or the resources that you need to initialize only once. And before each, what we are doing is it will be executed for each of the methods. So it will be executed before each method got executed. So it is before all, then before each, then the test case method, and obviously before, uh, after each, and then after all. Before each means before each execution of the method, it will be. So what you can do, we can you know change or initialize the set state of the test case out here in this method. Okay. So here we can you know update the test uh, state. What are you doing? We are just initializing the particular app here. So between each kind of method call, the state of the objects that you're going to create will be reinitialized. Now, obviously, what next we have is have the simple method like a sum. So this app method is doing what? This app method is taking a uh, number. Okay, I'm just using number stream, then map to int, and then I'm calculating the sum of it. Okay, just using our stream API, right? And here I am using the list of and I'm passing those values. Now, obviously, one, two, three, the value expected is six. So, what we do, uh, we basically do assertion, right? We call a method, we get a value, then we do an assertion. And assertion is basically what you are asserting. It is a uh, it is that this assertion class having like a several utility method. I can assert equals, I can assert not equals, I can assert true, false, whether it is a number, double Boolean value, etc. And I could also I can assert whether there is any uh, value is uh, not equal and etc. So if I can see uh, after assert, so all the methods are starting after assert. So what are the methods are there? It is been overwritten using different you know values primitive type of classes etc also you can have like a throw what are the exception may be thrown out of here right so always when you asserting you put what is the expected outcome of the method first argument then the actual method are method calling result and then you can give an optional string to represent what happened with that particular assertion now 
also we can do a assert instance of whether the particular object that been written is the instance of a certain class we can also check for assertion whether the object is null or not null that we can also check okay we can also check for true and we can also group multiple assertion together with assert all that we're going to see an example of array equal whether the two arrays are equals or not that is another option and other option is false does not throw any exception then iterable equals whether the lines are matching between the two uh, string or stream of string and then not equal whether the two objects are not equal that you can do so all these different kind of assertions are there so basically when in my particular test cases all the assertions are correct then what happen is i can say my test are correct why I use assertion i basically use the assertion because i need to in the unit test cases is that basically for me the method is just returning a value right and with that particular value what i like to do is i like to check what is my expected outcome is uh, expected value that i'm expecting is matching with our actual outcome right that's why we use the assertion so one simple form of assertion is assertion equals i'm just comparing expected value that is the first argument with the resulted value that is 6 and then the sum should be 6 that's a message i'm picking up that's the first example next one is also we can see that we when you're running this uh, particular code right we are also giving them a no you know a visual things so instead of what happened is going to say uh, test uh, test sum or test number but that doesn't make sense right so we can say sum of numbers we can asserting multiple values etc so giving them a more uh, you know easily understandable name for the other developer can understand what you are doing so that's the purpose of the display name annotation next uh, what you can do is uh, if i don't want a particular test method to be runnable so what i can do i can you know this method is doesn't have any assertion or nothing so this method is not yet implemented so i can do i can you know disable this and uh, this disable also works with conditional disable okay condition there are other notation for disabling it based on a certain condition that you can also put but here if i put a disable you can see that this test has been run but this method is been marked is not executed right okay and what are the message i pass that particular message uh, the display name is coming out here now i can do when i you know obviously asserting objects right asserting values i may get a total object out of the method right so what i'm going to do instead of you know asserting i can do like assert assert equals this value is going to this object dot get property then multiple properties i can do or i can combine them together into assert all so so what happen is how can i write this so basically if any of the method asserts all what i'm doing is i'm here having like a simple uh, number array and i'm just you know taking the expected value with uh, say number zero and then the actual value that you're putting there and i'm grouping them together into all like assert all and thereby they are coming uh, as a together so when happen if you have a multiple assertion if any of the assertion get fails then what happen is that your rest of the assertions are not actually executed now let's see this particular example to better understand this in this here instead of now having like an asset all what i'm going to say is asset equals that i already have right so i can you know remove all of them
So I am committing this part out. Now, uh, let's say I'm just making instead of three, I'm making it one. Okay. So I can also run this single method uh, also. So let me run that. So it will hopefully now going to get failed. Okay. Uh, the other thing is that I, do, I can remove the uh, commas with semicolon. Okay. So here my assertion is right. So what I'm going to do is uh, out of this, the first assertion is true, right? Now it has failed, correct? Okay. So what is expected value is three. Now the expected value is showing one, but it is, you know, exiting out of that. It is not evaluating this one. So, so when I'm you know, comparing the particular object and I'm comparing each of the expected property, I'm calling their getter method and then I'm matching their property. So if, if any of the properties are not matching up, what's going to happen is that that particular assertions are below to that is not going to be uh, executed. So if there is any further error is there, then have to go on and running everything, correct? So instead of doing this, what I are doing is we are actually using asset all. now same way let me try to fail the second assertion okay now again execute this okay so here my failure was there that's okay but if i now see is actually also what i can do i can make this as fun right so right now, what's going to happen? Only first assertion going to be shown, right? Next of the errors are not going to be shown, correct? But it is not like that. So when this particular error happen out here, it is going to show and it will fall through and execute the other thing. So that's why I'm able to now see that two values I have make it wrong. So now as a developer, it would be much more faster for me to use assertion all and thereby I'm able to figure out all the issues that are there. Now I can able to fix this. I can make it three and I can make it four because the actual and expected values need to be matched. Now if I execute this, everything got passed. So I hope we got the difference between the assert all and normal assets, multiple assets if you wanted to put there. To sum it up, the asset all when you're putting that, if any of the assertion gets fails, it also able able to execute the other assertions in the list. Thereby, I can able to figure out what are the issues are there. Okay, instead of writing the same test case again, fixing the one line, then moving it, and then execute that. Okay, so if we are having like a multiple array being written or a object been written it's better to use the asset all to do the assertion in a single go and if any errors are there i can easily discover in the first run itself any question so far hello yeah yes sir uh, can we uh, use asset in if I, uh, if statement assert in if statements uh, means what uh like uh you use uh, in asset like uh, if like uh, if else is my statement so. no if else is there into your uh code base right normally right. in test cases we don't put if and else asset okay. is not actually if and else asset is only checking whether the certain condition is holding true or false right okay. if it okay. is true then it going to be able to figure out that you are expecting is basically a comparison between the expecting your values or not, right? Right. If right. the assertion is failed, then it's uh, throws an exception that this assertion exception has failed, 
and that is stop your particular execution of your uh, test right and mm -hmm. means for that particular test within the particular test but if there are like multiple tests they all get executed and you can figure out which tests are failing which scenarios are failing that you can look at this okay okay sir. okay so it is mm -hmm. not a direct replacement of if and else okay, okay. okay. so we have yes. understood uh, life cycle method right we have mm -hmm. understood assert individual assert functions are there as well as we can group together assert all okay now let's look into assumptions okay assumptions are actually things which are being uh, checked whether a certain our assumption is true or false a certain condition is true or false if the condition is true then the following assertion get executed if it is false then it will not get executed. So if I execute this particular code, what happening is every test cases is passing. Okay. So assumption, what is the first assumption is doing? It's checking whether the value of five is greater than one. Correct. If it is one, then you are doing this assertion, right? Okay. So this is like assume true. So if assume true, then you execute the following things, right? And if you say assume false, then it will also not going to execute. And if this condition is fulfilled, but it is, uh, it is again, sorry, it get executed. But so this is like a kind of a, like a check or guard beforehand, if you wanted to, you know, do kind of execution of that. Okay. So for example, we can say assumptions that object is not null. Then I'm going to be go ahead and check that particular object's properties. So if the object is null, obviously what I'm going to get, I'm going to get the null pointer exception. So I can assume that object is not null. And then I'm going to be do all the kind of assertion that is there. Okay. The last example is expecting the string, assuming that. So if I wanted to, I can also write, write like this, right? In a single, I can combine this asserts okay and i can also combine the assume in a single statement i can say assumption assume that the string is equal to this value then you can check whether that particular assertion is matching on okay so the example of assumption is better suitable to use when you you know check some precondition for example if i am going to be Evaluating all the objects uh, getter method before that I will assume at least the object is not null. So I don't end up with getting the null pointer description. And if the particular condition is not fulfilled, then obviously it will not going to be executed and then it will be it will be having uh, error. So let's just let's do this. Let's just put say assume false out here, right? That is not going to happen, correct? Now, if I execute this, so if the assume is false, what are you going to do? You're going to basically going to disable that test. We can see the disable test icon coming up. So the assertion is not going to be executed. It assumption is failed. So you can see the test aborted, and we get this massive display. And that particular test is marked as disabled. It doesn't cause any failure of it. So any any question now on the assumption? If case where you can use the assumption, maybe. Have you no, understood? Yes. No, sir. You understand the difference between assumption and assertion. Okay. Uh, that's been done. Uh, now uh, let's look into what happened is uh, always not there like the methods are always going to be returning the proper data, right? They may also throw up exception. In my code scenario, right, I may have uh, simple things, right? I'm going to be doing a validation, right, on the arguments. So if I say invalid argument into a method it may throw up an argument exception illegal argument exception right so that may be a kind of a valid path of execution so 
sometimes what I need to do is I need to check both for successful or happy path as well as I need to check for, you know, error kind of a exception that is there, right? So that I also need to check. So how can I do that? So here in that I have one method I have defined. One is called a mask, right? Or maybe I call a method called trim, right? So in the trim is doing what? It basically taking a string. What is going to first check? It's going to first check in the if is that object is null. So if the object is null, it's going to throw illegal argument exception. Because I can only call a trim on a not nullable object, right? Okay. So it need not to be, it can be empty, it can be anything else. It can have multiple white spaces, but at least it should not be null, right? Because I, when I call any kind of instance method on a null reference object, I'm going to say it's a null pointer. So how to validate that? So there are two parts of my execution. One is that if it is going to be null, then I'm going to throw up the illegal argument exception. And if it is say not null, then I'm going to grade that particular trim value. I'm going to have those white spaces before and after the particular uh, text, right? Or word or paragraph, what may be, it will trim it out, right? So in that case, what's going to happen is, how can I, you know, validate this part, right? How can I handle or match exceptions? So for that, what we have is in the assertions, right? I can, you know, check this in two ways. Okay, what are those? Now in assertion, I have, I have imported that in a static format. So that's why you don't see the assertions dot method. Okay. Okay, so what I can do, assert close. That means I'm expecting a particular exception to be thrown out here. Okay. And when the exception is thrown out here, then obviously when I'm passing null, it is expected that it is going to throw an error or exception. So what is the class of exception that I wanted to assert? So I can put assert post and then I can put the class, exception class name, right? So it's illegal argument exception. Okay. And I just put a lambda out up beside that. And so that when that particular method is called, it is just saying illegal argument exception that validate my first part of things, right? So that's how can I handle exception. So I have another method, which method is not currently supported. Okay. So in that case, it is not implemented, right? I'm throwing an exception, unsupported operation. So this operation is not being supported. So here I'm passing a particular text. So this operation may not be supported the library version 1.0. So in that case, what I'm going to do, I obviously going to do the assert throw, right? What is the assert throw also returns me, right? Is that it returns me the exception object, right? So from the exception object, I already figure out its type, right? I already figure out its type that this is like an unsupported operation exception has been thrown. But if I wanted to assert anything else, on the throwable object or when you are doing the assert here, it's basically returns a throwable. So from that, I can also do check whether the messages is matching or not, right? So I can have like an exception get message and not supported in the version 1.0. The example of which say, for example, I'm you know, calling a method, right? and I'm going to be passing a particular ID of a user, so I'm going to be looking up from the database, right? So if I'm not getting that particular record from the database, I'm getting empty or null or something, requiring the DB, right? For my DAO object, what I can do in my service case, I can, you know, evaluate the path that, okay, this object is not present. But I require this object to do further operation, right? For example, I made a payment to somebody else, right? Now I wanted to refund the payment, right? So when I'm going to be refund the payment, obviously what I need to have is the one account has been credited, one account is debited. So if I need to do a reverse transaction, I should have both credit and debit account details for me. Now, if I try to look up this from another APIs, I find that particular credit account is, or debit account is not available. So in that case, what I can do, 
I can you know throw up the exception with the giving more meaningful message that I have not able to look up this account of the particular merchant of this the account number, right? So when I'm passing that particular object for refund, I passing the account number. So when I'm getting the exception, I can match that particular exception is of that particular text. Okay. So that's how we can you know handle the exception. Any question on exception handling or asserting exception? No, sir. Okay. No, sir. Okay, now we're going to go into uh, time of this. Okay, so now say this is like a like a long running task, right? Here I put time unit second, time sleep out and this. yeah, time of this. So what is basically it does if I say I'm making a call to a method and that particular function is calling an external service, right? API or soap service or anything. But maybe sending a message to a particular, you know, message queue or Kafka. So in that case, it will be it will be blocked. It will be blocking my current thread for a certain period of time unless that it gets a response from the, you know, from the external APIs or a message queue or whatever. Or maybe that we are making a database call. Correct. So instead of waiting for indefinitely, what you're going to do? We're going to be, you know, throw a time of error if that particular method is not resolved within a certain period of time okay so here in this particular method what are you doing we are making this method be sleeping for next 10 seconds okay using time unit second and then sleep 10. now in the time or paste what i'm going to do is I'm going to say that I'm not going to wait for that pin much long. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to just wait for the timeout and I can give the unit also. What is the timeout? It is going to be 100 milliseconds. So if the result is not coming 100 milliseconds, it's going to be failed. And when it's going to be failed, it's going to throw up an error. Okay. So basically it's... Uh, it's timeout and that particular timeout is failed if execution timeout exit 100 millisecond and that particular throws up an exception it causes a failure so that's one way of you know handling the long running methods of going the timeout okay now sometimes what you need to do is uh, we like to execute this test in a multiple number of times. Because why you want to do that? That's like a repeatable test. What you want to do that, that we want to be checking that. Uh, whether if I repeat the multiple test multiple times, whether the result is same. That means that there is no, you know, additional state side effect of that particular method okay not using any kind of google state and if it's been executed multiple times every time with the same kind of input it's going to be giving me the same set of results so what i'm going to do is i'm going to be having like a repeat test right okay i'm going to repeat this same payload or something using this many number of times so then I have to put the repeated test and I put say 10, 5 number of time it's going to be repeated. Okay. And then also the repeat test uh, return us the repetition info. Okay. Repetition info give us few details like what is the current repetition count? It is one, two or second repetition. How many times it currently it's repeating? What is the total number of repetition? depending on the annotation or value we put in the annotation right and then here we are getting that test method right so before each we have two methods right one is executing five time one is executing with the ten time okay another is uh, so when you're executing this what's going to happen is before each we can also access the repetition info 
and we can print out for each execution what is the number of time it been executed out of this many time how many total number of time it going to be executed right similarly what you can also do with the repetition notation is that we can give it a name right a display name so here we have given the display name which is basically a repeat then we put say concurrent repetition then total number of repetitions and then we have like a test info and then from the test info what we are doing is we are just getting the display name and we are asserting that so we are repeating one by one because it's only been added only once so if i am going to be executing this what happening if the repetition is multiple times so it is showing the repetition one of 10 one of two of 10 this of 10 these values are coming correct Okay, so this means the first thing is repeated 10 times and every repetition is successful. Next, what are we are doing? We are repeating 1 of 5, 1 of 2, etc. We are painting it out. Okay, and then if you wanted to, this is the by default, you know, nature of, you know, painting how many times this repetition has happened. If you override that, you can override that using this name. So name are now being changes to repeat one by one. So that's about repetition. It is required to validate whether that particular state is not being modified. Okay. Any question on repetition? So every time I execute, how many times I repeat, I don't know it's going to get the same result. Okay. Now data driven execution. So what is data driven execution? So currently, if I see this. If I see my methods, just give me one second. Yeah. Sir, you are on mute. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, let me repeat. Um, so we have understood uh, repetition test, right? Next, I'm talking about data driven test, correct? So in the data driven test, what we need to do is say, for example, I need to uh, 
implement or execute multiple scenarios correct so when i'm executing multiple scenarios i going to send a diff each scenario i going to send a different set of data so in that case instead of writing five different test cases i can write one single test case and i can pass on the different you know variable data into that right so that based on the value it going to be repeated so if i wanted to execute against the five values i can send the five values i'm going to repeat five times and covering the each five scenarios so that is basically i'm going to make my test parameterized then i'm going to have a source of those values being generated right so i'm going to put parameterized source the two example i'm given one is the value source can i put the hello unit test right it has a space before after post site etc and what i'm going to now have this parameters this uh, array the string array that is there it's going to come up in a you know i can take this particular individual values into the argument i call it a value you can give it any name so it will be executed three times first time i'm going to get hello junit and test driven data and then i call the trim and i am expecting the value should be trim is a same whatever i'm passing there okay that's parameter is one another way if i need to send some complex value right i'm going to need to send the object i need to send multiple values right so in that case i'm going to choose a method as my source okay so when i'm choosing method as my source so basically i'm going to use multiple argument so what i'm going to need in out of this method so here i've given a method name that is numbers okay so here i'm going to give a stream of arguments okay so it will be like a stream of argument argument i can pass any number of value 10 20 i can create a object i can also return that so 10 20 50 60 etc so now there are two arguments out here so i can capture them into my method parameter of my unit test cases that is argument number one and number two and i can you know compare their plus these two values and the calling the sum of them in a list they will be same so that if i want to do now execute this now this is becomes a parameter as well and then i want to see the numbers array argument so here is my repetition count that we have just seen right one two three now what is the argument argument value will be printed out here here we have used the two separate argument so one two three three execution repetition counts is coming out current repetition count and the, all the values that are there all the arguments that are there so that is basically your parameter is based okay now also another way of doing another test is the uh, dynamic test dynamic test so what is this doing here i have the simple app method in the app method i have like a simple method which take a string and it just make it upper class upper case right so again just like similar to my test driven test right i have to i don't have to write five different test cases or three different test cases i just simply pass the value each of the same test logic been executed and they have like a single test logic been executed and based on the number of values or argument i'm passing whether it's a simple value or list of argument that many times it's going to be repeated right that's that particular logic now when i'm talking about dynamic test actually i'm not writing any test i don't see other test annotation anywhere rather than i'm using a test factory the test factory on the runtime out of the objects of dynamic test it's going to create that many number of tests that are going to be returning out of that so it's basically stream of dynamic test so it's going to create those tests dynamically okay how they are doing that so here i have a simple two list one list is in a proper case another list is in an upper case right so from this particular initial list or the argument list that i can say simple i'm going to go into stream then i'm going to call the map and from there i'm getting the individual words and then i'm going to be returning 
converting this strings into a dynamic test so i can call dynamic test dynamic test test translate plus word then i'm putting what this test is going to be it's going to getting the word and it getting the index of it and from the index it's just matching it's called the upper method and also it's matching with the expected list whether they are individually matching or not okay so that means in this case what's going to happen is if i execute now obviously this test will be repeated thrice right and the display name of the test will be the dynamic test whatever message you have given the so test translate or test uppercase whatever that's going to be the message out here and here we are getting the particular index and then we are comparing that okay so that's uh, another way of you know creating test okay using a test factory where you are creating the dynamic test on the fly so here we are giving the test display name then you are getting the body of the test instead of using isolated test annotation right so the difference from this to parameterized test is what is that in parameters test still you have to write one test cases and only thing you are you know changing that is the number of argument and based on the argument is repeating that Then here the total test has been created dynamically using a test factory class, which is just written in dynamic test. It contains the display message as well as the body of the test that to be executed. Um, so that's about it. Do you guys have any question for now? Sir, that uh, this dynamic test function, what it is doing like? Okay. So dynamic test function, what is doing is first of all, uh, we don't see it's it's on the fly on the on the you know execution time right it's creating the test okay based on the based on this test factory so basically what you know the factory is basically is a pattern which creates a certain object right so instead of writing the test cases here the number of dynamic tests is written that many number of tests is get executed that means that many number of tests get created on the runtime. Okay, so here what you are doing is from this particular class, factory class, what you are doing, we are returning stream of dynamic tests. Here we have like a T input parameter, and uh, based on this T input parameter, obviously, if we do the stream, we're converting these words into the dynamic test. So, how many objects are going to get? We're going to get three dynamic test object, correct? And when you call the map, obviously it's going to be creating a stream of it, right? So that means when I execute the code, I can actually see in the list there are actually three tests being created on the fly, and they have been executed. Okay. So depending on the num, this factory is actually creating the test on the fly, and depending on the number of dynamic tests has been written, that many number of tests get executed or written, and then they are going to be executed. When they're going to be executed, obviously the test will requiring a body, right? It's going to have the assertion and everything, correct? So in that case, what happening here is. We are doing the assertion, we have provided the body. Only thing we have you know, changed here is that we have changed the display name. We can see the first thing is the display name, right? So when you're executing this with different words, be able to understand what is this test is run on. This test is run on this particular input value or this particular word, okay? So we, we can identify that what are the distinct tests that you have run, right? And then within that, each of those tests having that particular body, right? It has this access equal statement, 
it has the input statement that is the word right that is is using and that been executed correct does it now clear what is doing yes sir okay so, any other question so what is that value source can you explain it more so means uh, yeah sure so we are going into the our parameter is test right or data driven testing so what are you calling the data driven testing because uh, here the test case remain the same only we are changing the data that is used to invoke the particular test method right now if i need to pass a parameter as value i need to send some list of values now my values can be simple java wrapper classes or simple primitive types right in java or it can be a complex type right here in the example what you can see right i have you know passed the same value source annotation so first of all i say that okay this is like a parameterized test so that means the value that i can pass i can accept the value as a test method argument you can see right the method argument so this is like a parameter right and these parameters values are driven from this list right like so sir, the string value like the hello uh, gets like inside the value of the string uh, is test string function right yes so okay. basically what is your source data this is your source data right and this is like a primitive type so within the value uh, value source you have a different kind of you know data you want to send the primitive data so you can send shorts array you can send int array you can say long array float array double array char boolean string classes also okay. that you can send across okay and then how many time this particular test will be repeated that many values you going to have in your array okay and how are we going to get the individual values or the in the in your test case by declaring a variable okay so whatever you know type that you have chosen if you throw in string you can put string here int here then ints ints if you put there you can put int so that will become your parameter and that particular value you can pass here right and you can evaluate that okay that works for your simple data types right if i need to send a object that i then in that case i cannot use the value source then i have to use the method source and method source says what okay fine if i want to send multiple methods please wrap them in a stream of arguments arguments is what argument is nothing but a object var list right so you can pass as many object as you want in the argument you can pass two values three value five value four values if you want to do okay and that particular stream of argument you just you know create the individual argument the static method argument you create the arguments you make a stream you return that so here i'm passing two values so how can i capture these two values so i can put their data type 1 and 2 number 1 number 2 so number 1 been 10 number 2 been 20 and then i'm going to call the particular method and you know validate that they are particularly working or not okay does that clarify yes sir okay now also what i can do uh, we can see that from the id itself right i can you know execute the test like this okay i can also debug the test if there is a test case is failure i can easily put a breakpoint i hope we know how to put a breakpoint right okay and i can put a breakpoint yes. and also what i can do is i can do a coverage of it so when i run the coverage okay now if i go to the coverage right in the app method you can go inside the app method and in the app method now i can see which of the lines are actually get covered which of the lines are actually not get covered okay so green lines are basically which are getting covered right 
and if I execute the all of the code together, I can do the coverage also. We need to get to see like uh, what line get covered or not covered. Okay. I've been executed. Or I can choose this and I can also right click and also run the unit test case on that. I can execute all the unit test case. And get the overall coverage that is it okay there will be like uh okay there will be like all the methods that are there so when i do that i see that okay my coverage has been increased and then i can see which lines are we not covered which lines have been covered which conditions has been covered right the more you execute the test the coverage also will be increased also, this is like a, your ID that how you executing or seeing the coverage for your local. But when you executed that into a Jenkins server, right, in a CI server, so there we have to use the CO Fire plugin or JCoco plugin for Maven, where we can see the exact report being published to either Sonar Cube or it can be displayed within the particular metrics in the Jenkins also. Okay. So that's for today. Today we are able to cover only the first part of the JNIT uh, test cases, right? It's just a refresher part that we have done, right? Uh, tomorrow we're going to have another have another session on Mockito and on the maybe. So tomorrow we can again meet up uh, and see how much we can cover on Mockito and Spring JUnit. And if anything is pending on the spring uh, unit test cases, we can take it up on Thursday. Okay. Okay, sir. Okay. Then. Any other questions you guys have? If not, so, so which should I stop the recording? Yeah, please.